My mother was Magdalene number 322. Real name, Margaret. Margaret was committed to industrial school in 1954, aged two years and four months. She left 49 years later in a coffin. On the 5th of March, 1972, a young girl called Margaret Bullen was 19 and gave birth to twins in St. Patrick's mother and baby home on the Navan Road, where she'd been transferred to give birth to her babies from the Sean McDermott Street Laundry in Dublin city centre. She gave birth to a little girl and 15 minutes later, that little girl's twin sister was born and that's me. My name is Theresa Doyle O'Connor. I was in Sunday's Well in Cork, Magdalene Laundry. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and the first laundry I was in was in New Ross, the Good Shepherd. It wasn't the poverty that bothered us, it was just the sadness that our father had died. He died uh, just before I was born and my mother remarried. And I think that's when our torment and our disturbances started. My dad was a drinker and um, Friday evening payday, he couldn't pass the public house. I was 13 and I was going to school in St. Joseph's, New Ross. I remember on one day the, the nun called me and she said to me, You're, you, you have to go home now. When I got home, my mum was there and I knew something wasn't right. There was a nun at school that noticed how uh, withdrawn I was and how unhappy. And uh, she called me into the office and got around me somehow with a box of chocolates that was so posh and beautiful, I'd never seen anything like them, got me talking. And I told her that my stepfather was hurting me. It was sexual abuse and I was only a little child. My name is Mary Buckley, but they call me Betty for short. My name is Deirdre Cadwell. For punishments was sent to Shaw McDermott Street Laundry. I started off in the Good Shepherd Convent in Waterford. I went in there at the age of one and a half. I have memories of sleeping in dormitories. I have memories of being put to sit on a cold pot at night time to go to the bathroom and stuff like that. My mother got married the second time and the stepfather didn't want none of us. So I had to go to the convent. They got the priest to bring me down to the convent. I was only uh, 11 years of age. You couldn't talk about it because the threat was there that if you say anything, uh, you won't go to your grannies. And that was the only bit of love that we ever got. And I'm sorry. It was just horrific. And you were afraid to talk about it. And then when you do talk, what was did to me and the way that the, the church covered up and the state never gave a helping hand to ask where did I go to, where did I disappear to. Nobody cared, nobody wanted to know. All I know is the next day that there was a man who uh, drives the laundry van and he came to collect me. Dad said, get your coat on. I said, for what, Dad? And he said to me, um, because um, I'm taking you up to the laundry in the Ross. And um, I, I asked him, what was that? And he said to me, it's where you're going to get a good education. I have memories of hearing people outside the gates, but not knowing what was going on. I also have memories of going to school and getting expelled and then being told I was working in the laundry. People think they know the Magdalene Laundry story, but they don't. 
They don't know the half of it, to be honest. I never forget going up the hill and going up the big avenue into the convent. It was very frightening, to be quite honest, you know, very frightening. And the first thing that was said to me was, leave down your bag and go up that spiral stairs. The lady up there will give you clothes to pawn you. You can't wear your own clothes. And I said, well, why can't I wear my own clothes? And she said, don't answer me back and don't ask me questions. But I'm over 13 years of age, I'm entitled to ask you. And she said to me, don't ask again. So I thought, gosh, I better do what I'm told. The day I arrived, um, I knew by the two nuns that come out to greet me, I knew straight away this is not going to be good because no smile, no welcome. I was innocent. I thought I was going to go to school. The nuns start chatting and everything. There was no school mentioned, so there wasn't. It was work from the beginning. I was standing there with nothing on me. And I said, well, when am I going to get my clothes? And she said to me, when I'm ready. And I said, but I'm freezing. And she said to me, when I'm ready. And I honestly think she kept me longer than I should have been. Got the clothes and I put them on me. And she said, you don't look any better with clothes on you anyhow. And I said to her, you don't look a whole lot yourself. And she just turned around and hit me a slap in the face. There was no such thing as new clothes or anything like that. It's what had come in, what had fit you. You'd have to wear that. Shoes that other people got fed up with probably, and you'd have to wear them. And it was very cold in the winter, freezing cold. In Ireland, religious faith is no mere convention, for deep in the Celtic nature is a hunger for the things of the spirit. The history of 20th century Ireland contains a really awful story, and that is that we managed to lock up 1% of our population um, within a whole network of related institutions, psychiatric institutions, mother and baby homes, Magdalen laundries, industrial schools. And there's not a family in Ireland that actually isn't affected by this legacy. I grew up in a rural society, farmer's son, I have a long history with the Good Shepherd Sisters. My mother had one sister in the Good Shepherd Order. She had two aunts in the Good Shepherd Order and she had a grand aunt in the Good Shepherd Order. My father as well had two sisters in the Order. And would you believe my parents met on the day of the profession of my dad's two sisters and my mom's two sisters in the Good Shepherd Convent and love blossomed. There was a huge stigma attached to the word Magdalene Laundry or being an unmarried mother. Now, some of them were unmarried mothers, but by no means the majority. I was born in South Carlow, and to be honest, if I had stayed in South Carlow, I almost certainly would have been a farmer and probably a sheep farmer, because that's what my mother was. And it turned out that um, she'd had a relationship with a fairly close cousin. What happened was what was done to women in Ireland of those days. If you loved outside marriage and you had a child outside of marriage, it was a considered a scandal. The better thing would be to have the child adopted. So the parish priest apparently of the time had strong views on this, so that probably sealed the deal. Maynooth College carries on the traditions of those Irish scholars who kept Roman culture alive throughout Europe's dark ages. The priests it educates go out to every corner of Ireland, not alone to keep strong the piety of our people, but to shape their moral thinking as well. The Irish Catholic Church is a church of farmer's sons, publican sons, uh, businessmen's sons, and the politicians that ran Ireland are from not dissimilar backgrounds, so they share common values, the values of respectability, the values of 
property, in terms of the family farm, the values of a certain type of education. O'Connell Street's fairly paved with a sweltering mass of humanity, here to say farewell to Cardinal Lowry, who's come to the 31st Eucharistic Congress as the personal representative of Pope Pius. But the big doings take place at the 15-acre tract at Phoenix Park, where a million and a half people are gathering from every quarter of the globe, undoubtedly the greatest religious assembly in the history of the Roman Church. Power wasn't just at the top with the ring kissing. The power was at the bottom where a family could be shamed and destroyed if they were seen to have transgressed this rigid authoritarian code. There was a feeling that the church deserved respect and obedience, and this was regarded as normal and natural and healthy. It was very different from the position elsewhere in Catholic Europe, where the church was a, a divisive force. The church was often associated with the state, with the far right in politics. Anti-clericalism was prominent, particularly in France and Italy, but also in Spain. In Ireland, there were hardly any anti-clericals. I was very lucky. I got a home. Had I stayed in the orphanage system, and I know many people to whom this happened, at a certain age, when you were maybe about four or five, you went to an orphanage. And then as you got older, and maybe by the time you were 13 or 14, you could have been sent to a laundry. To be perfectly honest, I often thought I would never have survived it. I would have, I, I think I would have just died. I, I don't think I would have been strong enough to survive it. I was illegitimate. I knew from other people from our industrial school who went away somewhere, they just disappeared. I was down in the kitchen. I was chopping heads off fish. I was cleaning the fish for the dinner while all the others were at school. The nun in charge came down and said, come with me. I followed her up to the parlor. And because she was smiling, which she never did when she spoke to me, I followed her up and she shut the door. She stood with her back to it and her hands, both her hands on the knob, I, I can see her. And she said, sorry. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. Now, my girl, you've been complaining about doing all the work here. Uh, I finally found you a job and it'll be a long time before you get out of where you're going. I still didn't know where I was going. I was secret. Born in the mother and baby home, the 22nd of August, 1945. Remained in the Irish institutions for 19 and a half years in total. It was the Good Shepherd Convent in Limerick. They were taking no nonsense. They told me you wear the uniform, you have your name changed, and that's it. Otherwise, you never get out. I was given the name Stella, and I refused it. The nun got me by the hair, and she said, Stella, get down on your knees. She said, you're here because nobody wants you. And that's, that's always stuck with me, always. I entered the first Magdalen Laundry. I was in on the 19th of March, 1964. I was 14 years old and 10 months. I was taken by that nun. This is where you'll be sleeping. This is this. It was a cell. There was a pot you had to use at night time. I was a young girl, but there was women my age today and older right up till they died had to use pots in there every night. You couldn't leave the cell once you were in there because you, it was bolted. I didn't commit a crime, but I'm treated now like a prisoner.
the nuns said to me that I would corrupt an army of soldiers. I think they thought I was a temptation to men. I think they thought I was a bit too attractive or too... I, I don't know, but I think they kind of wanted to clip my wings, stop me from being who I was. To give you an idea of how conservative Irish society was, even up to the 1950s, when the sisters were going out to Foynes in their minibus, they had to put curtains on the minibus because local people said it wasn't fitting that nuns could be seen driving through the countryside. Their place was within the convent. The bloody revolt that had been brewing for centuries broke out anew in 1919 as the final battle for independence from English rule blazed up in the streets of Dublin. This was no local disturbance, but a full-fledged war that was to cost the lives of untold thousands before it was done. The, hated... the Irish Revolution was a very conservative affair. W.T. Cosgrave was the minister for local government in the underground Irish government, the Doyle administration. And he suggested to the president, de Valera, that the Doyle should have an upper house. He called it, extraordinarily, a theological board. And this would be a body that would vet legislation by the Doyle to make sure that it didn't conflict with Catholic doctrine. De Valera said it would be a mistake to do it. After all, it would imply that we ourselves couldn't be trusted without such a theological board, that we couldn't be trusted to implement Catholic views ourselves. So the idea was dropped. But it still gives an insight into the way in which some Irish politicians thought in terms of very, very close relationships with the Catholic Church, with the Vatican and with the bishops. After independence, the state ceded control, influence and oversight in a whole number of what are normally state functions to the Catholic Church. What state capture meant in practice was that the church and the leaders of the church called the shots in relation to key areas of public policy such as social services, such as health services, particularly services for women. I think we look at the Magdalen Laundries as if they were a particularly Irish thing, as if we were the only ones who had it, we created them. We didn't. They're part of a whole European-wide network. They were considered as very uh, forward-looking in their creation. Nothing better came to replace them, and that's actually the fault of the Irish Free State, which I have to say from my work in the archives was extraordinarily mean, and very, very tight about anything to do with women's welfare. They didn't even have a women's remand prison for decades, and there's lots of documentation on that. So there was a very anti-woman and very tight, mean budget approach to destitute women in the Irish Free State. At the time of the last census in 1966, there were 13,409 nuns living in Ireland. This means that there are more than 10,000 nuns engaged in various kinds of social work in this country. The contribution that they are making to the life of the nation is almost incalculable, even in economic terms. Many nuns carry out highly specialised and essential work for no salaries whatsoever. We should remember that Ireland, until the 1970s or 80s, had been a very poor country. The government didn't have much money. It was very much in everyone's interest, it was felt, for the church to control education. It did so much more cheaply. It removed a burden from the taxpayer. Sometimes in the convent, you wouldn't be called your name. You could be called anything. So you would put a good name. The nun called me back and she said to me, I just want to tell you, you're not Theresa Dial as I'm from today. You're Joseph. I said, of course I'm not Joseph. I'm Theresa Dial. And she said to me, no, you, as I'm from today, 
in here, your name is Joseph. Do not tell anyone where you come from, who you are, or anything else. Your new name is Francis. And I said, I can't have a new name. My name is Maureen. No, 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 you're Francis here. Now, it took me days to get used to it. The sisters were forbidden to give them a name. They were given an assumed name so that nobody else would know their history. Their assumed name went with them all their lives in that place. They had a number. And what was dreadful was the word P-E-N was in front of the number, which stood for penitent. They were doing penance for their sins. Now, that was the old regime, which was a very harsh regime. Families dumped daughters and aunts and sisters who were deemed in the way are perhaps the object of shame. Irish society and Irish families re-victimised the female victims of male sexual violence, be that rape, be that incest, be that sexual abuse. The family was sacrosanct after the 1937 constitution. The Ireland that we dreamed of would be the home of a people who valued material wealth only as a basis for right living, of a people who, satisfied with frugal comfort, devoted their leisure to the things of the spirit, a land whose countryside would be bright with cosy homesteads, whose fields and villages would be joyous with the sounds of industry, with the romping of sturdy children, the contest of athletic youths, and the laughter of happy maidens. It's a story of shame and the need to conceal the shame. It was a brutal society, I feel, in terms of attitudes to women who were seen to have sinned. What is an identity? And I kept saying to her, what do you mean, what's an identity? And she said to me, you give me, I asked you the question, you give me the answer. Well, I said, I was christened with Theresa Dial. I wasn't christened Joseph. Joseph is a fella's name. I said, I'm not a fella, I'm a girl, you know. And she said to me, what? And you think that should matter, that you should kick a hullabaloo in here about your identity? Do you realise, she said to me, you don't have any rights in here? I said, and I just said to her, I'm beginning to see that now. Hello, and welcome to RIARC. In Ireland, we tend to take nuns for granted. They've always been here and they always will be here, in convents, in hospitals and in schools. Most of us first come into contact with a nun on our first day in school. It is a strange and solemn occasion for all concerned. The desks, the schoolroom, and one of the strangest parts of it all is the first close-up look at a nun. Dressed in black from head to foot, she creaks and rustles and clanks alarmingly whenever she moves. The children are not like they were in my time. We, were, we had a healthy fear of the nuns and respect, which I'm afraid is not there now. Throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th, for a young, talented, energetic, ambitious woman, the church was probably the only possible career. She could get married and influence a husband, otherwise she would join a convent, and there she could exercise a degree of power and authority, and she could achieve some ambitions. No other area of life in Ireland did that. Well, would you like to be a nun? If I could be me, I would, very much. It interests me because, um, well, I think, Although a lot of people sort of hold it against nuns, that they're nuns and they've got a little black habit long down to their feet and everything, you can get close to an awful lot more people. I, I thought, you know, that I could do great things. Now, that's sounds horrendous when you say great things. But I mean, I really do think that God had chosen me to be a nun and I should do anything and everything within that area. And that, that would fulfill me because I thought God had chosen me. The Sisters of Mercy had the Magdalene, looked after them, and had the orphanage. So I thought they gave more. 
So from that point of view, it was good for me to be there. The mission of Our Lady of Charity was to provide a home for vulnerable and destitute women. They were founded in the 1600s to give women who were looking to leave prostitution, to give them a place of safety. Target women were those for which no other Catholic charity had any time. The importance of the concept of the Immaculate Conception was the importance of the sacrament of penance, the importance of confession. The myth of the figure of the Magdalene that originated in the early years of the church's formation and was, I suppose, elaborated on over centuries means that just the term or just the name Magdalene has connotations even today of sin and sex work. And in the Bible, there's no reference to this sinner being a prostitute or a sex worker. They only describe her as a woman who, who sins. These convents and, and institutions were set up for fallen women, for single mothers. There's no surprise why the Magdalene Laundries were so titled in Ireland. Mary Magdalene and the Virgin Mary are seen as sort of opposite sides of the same coin in some ways. You know, the, the Virgin was born without sin. She was a virgin for her entire life and she had no need for penance, while the Magdalene is, is the opposite in that she is a reformed sinner, somebody who had, in the church's eyes, been the worst of the worst, one of the most depraved kinds of women, and then reforms and is saved through the act of confession. This art absolutely had a direct impact on people's lives. It taught people that it wasn't okay to be a free, loose woman, that it was important to be virtuous and pure, and if you weren't, then it was essential that you confess to be redeemed. At age 13, Margaret had her IQ measured. She was certified as fit for work, not for education. There was a school across the yard from us. We used to hear the children playing and at school like, and I wasn't at school, so I wasn't. I got no education. Many a days I spent crying and I still had to do the work and everything. They wouldn't believe you if you said you were even sick. No way, it's just work, work, work. I have a vision of all these women working in these big machines, these roller things where they used to put the sheets in. They were all singing hymns. All you could smell was carbolic soap and steam. And those women worked all day. In the morning, you get up early and you clean the corridors. One morning you might polish them, the next morning you'd shine them, the next morning you'd wash them again, and then you go to mass, then you come back and you have your breakfast, and then you go on to work in the laundry. Working in the laundry was very, very hard. I mean, because I was so small, the women would, if they couldn't reach down to the end of the basket to get the dirty clothes, they would pick you up and put you in there and you would throw, throw the sheets out. You would also be standing on, on a wooden box and just scrubbing sheets. Mother Loyola was up on the pulpit and she said no, she shouted no talking, no talking. I hadn't a clue what I had to do, I was just standing there. And then this other lady came up from behind. She said to me, pick up the iron, the iron is hot, and start on this basket of clothes here. And I looked at the basket of clothes, oh my God, they were about this high from the ground, and I thought, oh gosh, I never earned them. I said, well, I never earned before. She said, well, you're about to learn, aren't you? I said, I suppose I am. I was ashamed, so I was disgusted. Do all the old dirty laundry from St. Peter's College, just down at the back of us. The clothes used to be filthy, and you'd have to handle that, like no mask on you or no gloves. It was, you wouldn't know what you get so you wouldn't. And then you go to bed and do the same thing the next morning. After about two weeks, she said to me, I'm taking you off the iron and I'm putting you down to um, 
it was for pressing sheets and blankets. And I remember standing there with a blanket like this out and going as far as I could, trying to reach out, you know, to put the blanket through. The same with the sheets, pillow covers, even towels, even face cloths. And I'll never, ever forget the name on them, the Metropole Hotel in Cork. All of the clients there, it went from the President of Ireland, the ministers, the army and navy, the hospitals, the hotels. They had Limerick Prison, the mental hospital contract, they had meat factory contracts, white coats from the meat factories. In those days, there were thick cotton white coats. They had the regional veterinary laboratory, contracts like that. Most of the women who ended up, who resorted to or who used the asylums in Hyde Park and in Sean McDermott Street, used them because they had no other place. They knocked on the door, no questions asked, they got accommodation. They didn't pay anything, the state didn't pay anything. They worked for their keep, the same as the sisters did. As a nun, you were the boss, and they were the women who worked. Like a factory. I didn't feel sorry for the women. Well, I suppose I did in a way. I, I, I thought it was a bit unfortunate that they landed there. But I thought, well, they had children out of wedlock, and that's where they belonged, which was a terrible thing to think. But that's the way I thought. They were serving their sentence. It was a prison. And we actually behaved as if it was a prison. These women were locked up for sins they committed. Did you ever? There were many, many sisters working in the laundry as well. Each department had a sister in charge, and that sister would have an assistant. So I've seen sisters unloading washing machines, feeding ironing machines, handling soil laundry, packing clean laundry side by side with the ladies in the class. Every bit the same, the same hours, everything. Now, there's a huge difference. The sisters were there by choice. The ladies weren't sent in there by choice. They had no choice. We worked with them. We did the same. I packed baskets of laundry, baskets of linen, the very same as they did. I sat taking lists of laundry, the same as they did. We, we went to the same church. We attended the same chapel. We had the same confessor. We never got paid for it. We were working instead of getting an education. As in all jobs, I guess, if you want to call it a job. Accidents will happen. Women got burnt, steam burns, water burns. Things fell, people got hurt, got cut. There was no first aid station there, so they sort of had to just do it themselves. The physical labor, the heat, the smell, the, the abuse, it was abuse. I was there for one year in the Magdalene, and I saw no physical punishments. A business, they had to run a business. They knew how to run it, but it, it made them less of a sister of mercy, that I can assure you. If you maybe weren't working quick enough, you'd get a dig of the cross into you. They used to carry these rosary beads around on them, big, long rosary beads, but the cross was real big on it, and they'd put their two fingers around the cross and they'd just dig it in. And it was so horrific, the pain of it. You'd kind of go up on your feet, on your tippy toes. There'd be bruises on you for weeks after it. You get this vision of kind of women over sinks, you know, up to their elbows, practically being whipped at it. They're the images that come to me, and that's not true of, of the actual kind of um, the laundry work. And we know that because we have inspectors, we have reports, we have the updates themselves, we've got the accounts, we've got the constant work on it. And, and the, the evidence of the sisters and women who were there themselves who talk about it. And then the day was punctuated because they had lots of prayers, lots of tea breaks, lots of, you know, communal meals. So you didn't have kind of unbroken slavery hours. 
and that some of the films as well make it appear as if you had. When I went to Waterford, I was taken upstairs to Mother Mary of Grace's office and I started talking to her and she, she was different to the others. And she turned around and she said, my God, what have they done to you? She respected me. She gave me a sense of wanting to live at that young age. She gave me a sense that there was, there could be a life for me somewhere, a good life. Margaret didn't know where she was from or when her birthday was. We told her when she was 42. Saturday was letter day and I used to see them all getting letters and I used to think to myself, why am I not getting any letters? You know, have they forgotten about me? I'm not getting any letters. They kept the letters. They kept my mother's letters and they kept my letters from going to them because I told them the truth about what was happening in there. I wanted them to know because I thought if they know they might be able to do something, I need to let them know I'm not in school, you know. Uh, and I actually put in it and I really did. I put in, we're slaving, we're children slaving. And I suppose that was what they didn't like, you know. They never posted them. I know that for a fact because when I saw my mother, she never had a letter for me. We were all abandoned by everyone, really. You have been constantly being told, nobody loves you, nobody wants you. Your mother dumped you. I got boxed, I got kicked, I got pinched, the hair pulled and everything else. You will do it. Your name is Enda. I will take your freedom from you. The women were so dead, I, can, I think I'll have to put it that way did look at you, but they were afraid to speak to you. And they'd kind of whisper, you're only a child, what are you doing here? And you'd be trying to tell them, well, I don't know. And you'd get a few little things out, but other than that, you couldn't have a conversation. Even in the recreation room at night, when we'd be all sitting around the table, there was a nun up at the top watching us. It was terrifying, because you had these big, long dormitories, and women walking around with little or nothing on them, and talking in their sleep, and running up and down the hallways. So it was terrifying, you never slept. You can't wait then for the morning to come, even though you know you're going to work in the laundry. At least you're not in the dormitory. There was this lady two doors up from me. She probably was my age now, Bridie was her name. And she used to call out, my baby, they took my baby from me. Where's my baby? And she used to really be upset and that frightened me. The only nuns I knew were cold or cruel, or hid away and did nothing. Many nights, God forbid me, I left the bed soaking. I was that depressed and everything. I couldn't help it. But then they come up and give out to you. You'd have to sleep in that all night. There'd be no such thing, well, to change, you need clean sheets to change the bed. No, there wouldn't be anything like that. I was accused of stealing another resident's, uh, her suite. I was dragged to a cell. I remember a, a blanket on the floor. There was a chair in the corner which you would put the potty in. And that was it. I remember there was a hatch at the end of the door, the foot of the door. And that's where bread and water was put in during the day. To be in a cell for three days and nights, it was the worst, worst nightmare of my life. Sunday was the holy day, and we wrote praying in the yard all day long. And I used to think to myself, oh my God, you know, where's, where's God now with all this going on, you know? I have a dilemma that I know from my aunts 
they were the most charitable, good-natured, decent people. They wanted to do good. They thought they were doing good. They wanted to save souls. They wanted to help people who were downtrodden, but they were caught in this system. And if you didn't toe the line in the system, you were sent home in disgrace. Certainly a scene like this no longer holds the same attraction that it once did for the average girl. Today it makes her think of such currently unfashionable things as regimentation, discipline, of a strict hierarchical chain of command, of the suppressing of individual personality in favour of a general uniformity of dress and behaviour and mental outlook. Frightened. And out of it I thought I'd never get. My year in the mountain was my last year in the convent and it certainly was the last year I wanted to be a nun. Certainly I did not want to be a nun anymore. didn't ask enough questions, or the generations before us didn't ask enough questions. We were happy enough, on the one hand, to know that the work was done. And as a society, we were convenienced by the fact that these problems were taken care of. Lots of middle and upper class families utilise the service provided by these institutions. And did we honestly, can we hand on heart, honestly say we thought the nuns were washing the sheets? I don't think so. In 1954, the government's Department of Education uh, issued a circular in which it said the main function of primary education was to train children to love and fear God. And this was taken for granted by the government department. This wasn't an edict laid down by the church. And it is a very good example of the way in which church and state were hand in glove. They were close allies. They saw each other as reinforcing each other's role. As a young man, when the elders of my family would use expressions like the sins of the flesh were the greatest sins that man could commit, my, I used to retort, what category would you put Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin in? It, it was incomprehensible that they could say this was the greatest sin that man could commit, but they firmly believed that. They firmly believed it. And they firmly believed that you, they were saving the souls of these people by locking them up. And they could portray holy Catholic Ireland to the world as a bastion of Catholicism. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the word, Ich bin ein Berliner. I remember when I was in Limerick, uh, Percy Kennedy was coming to Ireland, and I realised, oh my God, I've been here nearly two and a half years now. We welcome you as the representative of that great country in which our people sought refuge when driven by the misery of tyrant laws from their motherland. We trust that under God's inspiration and with his help, you will be able to accomplish the aims which you have in mind, the aims of all who love mankind. And it was only then I realized that I'm still here, you know, you're on the other end of the scale. Nobody knows you, as far as we're concerned inside, nobody knows we're there. When uh, my great-grandfather left here to become a uh, cooper in East Boston, he carried uh, nothing with him except two things. 
a strong religious faith and a strong desire for liberty. I'll always remember when the film crew from America came to Ireland, to Limerick, to the Good Shepherd Convent, and they wanted to see where the, the lace had been made because this was the gift that was given to President Kennedy for his wife, um, Jackie. I was told that I would dress as the bride and wear the veil. Before he left Limerick on his way back to America, the nuns of this convent presented Mr. Kennedy with a gift of world-famous Limerick lace. For hundreds of years... It really takes me back there. All to sit in that lace room, not allowed to speak. I felt very trapped. Seeing this all again, is, it's really, really quite emotional. And of course, me wearing this, oh my God, that brings back memories. All I was thinking of, I want to get out. Last night, somebody sang a song which says uh, the word that which I'm sure you know, which come back to Aaron, the morning, the morning, come back, Maroon, to the land of thy birth, come with the shamrock in the springtime, the morning. This is not the land of my birth, but it's the land uh, for which I hold the greatest affection. And I certainly will come back in the springtime. Thank you. They denied my freedom. They, they took away two and a half years of my life. And I'll never forget that. For women like Margaret, there was no way out, nowhere to go, to get away. You needed help and a home. The women were called the Maggies, and the general consensus of opinion around the city was that the Maggies was a place full of whores who had all had babies out of wedlock. That's what it was. That's what the story that was circulated around the city. It was full of scarlet ladies, if you want. We lived in a corporation estate in Merivue. My mum and my dad, Hugh and Ina, my brothers, Declan, Hugo, and I. To boost the finances, my mother went looking for a job, and she got a job as a lay worker inside in the Magdalen Laundry in Galway City. My mother, she got so close to them, they used to tell their tales of woe, uh, good and bad, mostly bad, to my mother. It was a holy day, and we were out the back and two of the girls walking behind me said, Jesus, look over there, there's a hole in the ditch. And the, the two behind me said, when we get up there, we're going through that ditch. As I got closer to it, I thought, Jesus, maybe they're right, maybe we'll get out of here. So as soon as I seen the ditch, I went through it and they came behind us. And we were running down, it must have been a quarter of a mile down the field. And when we got to the bottom, there was a massive big, gray, big green gate and we couldn't climb over it because it was iron. Some Sundays we'd be allowed out to go for walking maybe halfway down the town and ha some of the girls would disappear, wouldn't come back, so they wouldn't. Some of them would get away free and some of them be lifted like to be brought back. It was terrible to see them crying and everything. We kept trying to get up and trying to get over a big hedge, but our legs got caught and everything, right? One got outside, but us two were stuck inside when a gardener came and caught us. And that was the end of that. We were brought back in and she was brought back in and we definitely paid a price for that. We were a whole week in the dormitory for that. Well, it started off as kind of a mild joke, as you know, <laughs> so we, we'll do something, you know. So myself and this man, started to talk on her own. So the, what, could we organise something? It can't be that severe, you know. So we talked to Mum and Dad about it. So we put a structure in place, and we thought about this for weeks, and we were saying, no, 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 that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. How many ran away, I don't know. 
They all wore a uniform. They all had the same style of a haircut. They had brogue shoes, so they, they would stand out a mile when they were uptown if they ran away. And they wouldn't get very far when the phone caller would go in to the guard's station. I think I thought I was there for life. I thought there's going to be no out of here. That's why I kept saying to him, can you contact my grandmother? Showing my innocence, I thought that that would happen and that would be OK, but no. I realised, I think, as you go along there, that that's not going to happen. And of course it's in your head, am I ever going to get out of here? Am I here? Is this my life now? If a woman escaped, they would ring the local police to find them. And 90% of the time, they would find them because they wouldn't have gone very far. And when I think of it, do you know what I mean? I was very naive. I would have allowed them to escape, believe me, but not then, because I wouldn't, I didn't understand enough. Magdalene Laundry was on Foster Street. Parallel to Foster Street and up behind the local church was Prospect Hill. There was a walkway up by the side of the church to Prospect Hill. So we arranged that Dad would have the van at the exit there. Declan would be standing at the door with it closed until we appeared. And as soon as we appeared, he would open the sliding door. Everybody would pile in. in. So that's actually what happened. I was at the gate at a specified time. Mom opened the inner door. Four, was it four girls or three the yeah. first time? I think it was four. They were scared. I never saw anybody. I thought we were scared till I saw these girls coming along. Terrified. Out. Terrified. We held hands and we ran up. Hugo was standing at the end of the walkway. Just as terrible. And he took two girls hand in hand, and I took two. Declan saw us coming up in the van. Everyone piled into the van. On the ground. We're all in the van. Four girls, the three of us, Terrified. are in the back of the van. It's a Volkswagen van, not huge, but we're there. And bar one of us, everyone's on the floor because there's a big back window. And the one of us was looking out the window to see was anyone following us. That's how nervous we were. So we proceeded to head down Prospect Hill, down by the side of Air Square, drove straight up past the front Make of the laundry, laundry, and out to Merview, which is a journey that took about 15 minutes. And as soon as we parked outside the house, one of us got out of the van first, flew in and opened the door to a short distance, and everyone piled in and closed the door. And there was another sigh of relief all around. Oh, left. Now the girls had no idea where they were. They didn't care. They just didn't care. We thought we were breaking every law in the book. We weren't we're breaking the law at priests. all. We were not breaking the law at all. They were. But we thought we were. We were stealing these girls. We were breaking them out of <clears throat> a prison. The Great Escape, we call it. That's what we call it, yeah. When I ran away, there was a freedom in that. I could breathe. Because I couldn't go back, I was suffocating. And if I'd stayed there much longer, I probably would have died there. Some of the neighbours were let in on it, respected what we were doing, never said a word. And uh, them girls never went outside. They were happy enough to be inside. They could make tea, they could listen to the radio, they could have papers, they could have books, they could have whatever they wanted, which was a holiday for them. So for weeks they were happy. In the meantime, my father was making arrangements about the plan to get them safely away, which was a big one. It's uh, 1968, I'm 16 years of age, and I went in to the Reverend Mother, knocked on the door and told her that my shoes was hurting me and that my mother feels that I should be earning some money now. That evening I was told to get all my stuff together, which wouldn't have been much and put them into the little case. And the next morning I was taken to Euston Station. I was given five pounds and I just headed off to England. My dad left the house of an evening and headed to Atten Rai. He looked after the financing of the expedition, bought the tickets possibly at the station. The girls got onto the train in Atten Rai what we call the boat train, and they went to England that way. We were responsible for putting at least 15 people on the Freedom Trail. 
But we laughed and laughed at the success we had. At this stage, we didn't care who knew what. We were so happy. And it was over. The nun said, today we'll be saying goodbye to Joseph. And will Joseph stand up to say goodbye to all the ladies and that? And I said to her, I will, but not as Joseph. My name is not Joseph. And I stood up and I said, girls, I'm sorry to be leaving you behind today in this place, I said. And I said, because this place to me was hell. But I said, my name is Teresa Dial and I come from New Ross County, Wexford. I have my identity back today. I'm going home. Finally, they just woke me up early in the morning and they said, Stella, shh, get up, you're going. Dad said to me, I bet now you're going to thank me for the good education you got. And I said, what, Dad? And he said to me, the good education you got. And I said, Dad, I never got any education. I never seen any school. The only thing I seen was an ironing board and a big iron from half five every morning to half six every day. And we prayed all day Sunday. That's what we done, Dad. And I said to him, and that's what you put me into. I actually turned around and I said to him, some children hate their fathers, don't they? And my mother drew out and hit me a slap in the face. And she said to me, don't speak to your father like that, have respect. I went to bed, it was never spoke about in the house again. Never spoke about. One million people left this country since it became a free nation. Poets, writers, ballad singers, all have placed this boat in our consciousness. It is part of our Irishness, this movement of people. But Willie O'Reilly has little use for this kind of abstract thinking. He feels not the pathos, but the pinch. When I came over to England in uh, 1969, on the 2nd of February, as I got into the customs, they said to me, have you got anything to declare? I remember putting my case on a, on a table and I laughed and I said to him, I'm lucky I've got myself. He laughed. I went off. I found that in England, I could be open and honest. We were so broken at this stage that we just didn't care. And all as we wanted to do, and me anyway, and a lot of the women I talked to, a lot of them went to England, nearly every one of them went to England, it was just to get out of Ireland and get away from it all. Eight million people live and work here, each with his own plans and ambitions. It was tough. I was living in squats. I slept on the streets. We, we had no money. Got jobs, maybe one that lasts for a few weeks, another you might get it for three weeks. I even worked on a building site and put my hair up under a peak cap and let on I was a man. Wages was very small, rent was quite dear. We couldn't get a good job. We didn't have the education to get a good job. It, it wasn't easy, it was a very hard start, but at least in a squat, you were better off. You could get up in the morning, you could walk down the street, you had your freedom. Was England good to me? Yes, yes. I've had ups and downs, don't get me wrong, but I got an education, I did a degree. I was lucky, I married a good Englishman. My children were born in England. I'm, oh, and they're not Catholic, and I'm very proud to say that. I came back at one stage, I was pregnant, and my mother didn't want to know, so she didn't, Lord of mercy on her. No way. So I went back to England, and then we got married, myself and my husband, that's passed away now. So I had four like in England with me. And then when I came back to Ireland, I had another few. So I had, but I had a girl in between and things happened. She died like before I was really due. And in England, then I lost twins. They were nearly due too. England for me was my savior. It was my freedom away from the Catholic church the nuns and the state. 
we had no chance here. We really were kind of very alienated from the Irish people. We're runners. We're always, always on the run. Security is not something that we know. Being loved is not something that we know. And I don't care. There are some people out there that are married and have kids and, and all of the rest. It doesn't work for everybody. It does not work. No matter how hard you try, it's, it's something in there that was preventing you from being 100% totally honest and just breathing because I haven't been breathing. I've been married. <laughs> Very short married. Because I can't breathe. I can't just breathe and say, this is it. This is what I have now. It doesn't come natural. So I run. It was the Bendix washing machine, more so than any protest or charging of the, the barracks or tearing down the gates that resulted in the closure of the Magdalen Laundry. Perhaps it was the laundromat uh, coming into Irish towns and the private households being able to afford to have a washing machine rather than any great social movement, rather than a political will, rather than a feminist critique. That all came much later. When the commercial laundries closed down, so in the 1990s we see the last of them closing down, the w women who were held to work there continued to do odd jobs and other kinds of labour for the orders and continued to live in the kind of dormitory accommodation before they were taken out and put into other kinds of sheltered and nursing homes run by the orders. What shocks people the most about my story is that it was recent. It wasn't a different world, it was today's world and it was still happening. The first time we met Margaret, I was already living in New York, so I came here to Dublin for the meeting. I wanted to make contact just out of curiosity. I wanted to know what Margaret looked like. I thought maybe we would get along and it would be sort of like an extra family member. Not, not to reject my adopted parents who, who are wonderful, but just an overwhelming curiosity to see where did I come from, what did she look like, who was she now. When you go to meet somebody that you've heard about but never met and you're also like related to them in the most close way that there is, there's so much to think about beforehand and so many perceptions that you have in advance and they were all absolutely smashed when I walked in the door of the Gresham. She had the, the face of hard work the face of inadequate nutrition. I thought she looked poor. She was poor, she had nothing, she had nothing. And she was wearing a polyester dress, which was about three sizes too big for her. She had a navy, not a real leather handbag, a kind of a dress bag with a little golden clasp on it. And she was holding the bag like an old lady or like the queen <laughs> and the bag dropped. I picked it up, you know, just as a courtesy to help her. And the bag fell open and there was absolutely nothing in it. Nothing at all. She told me small things about her life. She was very proud that she did the readings at Mass. She was trying very hard, and we were too, to be polite and friendly and open. But she obviously wasn't used to being in somewhere like the Gresham. She was really awed by just coffee, first of all, because she never had that before. We would say, do you take milk? And she'd say, do you take milk? And if we did, she did. And then I remember Etta saying to her, do you take sugar? And she said to Etta, do you take sugar? And Etta said, I do, too brown. And she went, too brown. There was too much of a gap, the lots of opportunities that Sam and I had, and she ha didn't have at all. Margaret, she was fed. There was a roof over her head. I mean, you'd give that to a donkey.
Sam and I were adopted when we were nine months old by a, a couple named Anne and Eamon. They were thrilled to have us. We were very vulnerable when they got us. We couldn't do any of the normal milestone things that nine months old can do. Things like sitting up and rolling over and doing the various things that babies can do at that age. We couldn't do any of that. So our family could see that we needed a lot of extra care and love and we got it. And Dad, Eamon, would sometimes just go down to the laundry himself and he used to bring her 50 euro voucher for Duns so she could buy some clothes. And one of the social workers or helpers would bring her out to buy things. But she said she mostly <laughs> bought cigarettes with the voucher. Maybe they had no families to claim them, but none of them wanted to leave. They just hadn't the confidence to go out. Can you imagine? They didn't know how to boil an egg. They never did their own shopping for groceries. They never handled money as such. Look, I didn't even know the facts of life when I came out. I knew nothing. They don't tell you anything. They don't educate you. So you're out into this big, big, bad world and you're trying to do it on your own. I mean, they don't even show you what a bank is. I had no idea how to deal with a bank. I probably could have cooked an egg. I met a guy. We then had a relationship. I had him working in a factory. He abused me any way he could, but I didn't know that, you know, he, I could have reported it to the police. I, I just thought this was normal behavior. We all grew up with being walloped or slapped. I just thought it was normal. Did you ever feel like it's sometimes way back when you're 30, you think you're old? This, oh God, I'm getting old and I've got, I haven't done very much in life and how am I going to give my children an education that I haven't got, I can't help them. And then that started to really, really upset me. And it was just one night I just took a load of tablets. I said, I've, I've, they're better off without me. And of course, after when you look at your children, you think, God, how, how was I so low to do something like this? But you feel you're getting nowhere and you're not going to be able to help them or make their lives better. So when I was leaving the hospital, they said, you, you, we want you to sign something that you're going to go and get counselling. And it was the best thing I ever done. Because that she was a Scottish lady and uh, she opened up everything for me, got me talking about what happened to me. And I couldn't even say the proper words at that time of what my stepfather had done. I always used to say abuse. And she said, no, Maureen. It was sexual abuse to an innocent child. And she said, don't be afraid to say it. It took me years to say it. I had to work on that and work on it. And even when the Magdalene things used to come out, I used to always say, even in interviews, oh, well, I was, there was abuse in the home. I thought, if I say it again, am I going to be hurt again? Am I going to be locked up again? What's going to happen to me? Every society, every community, every individual, every church has its own lepers. They can be locked away or kept out of view of heart or mind, or they can be embraced. To be Christian, I think, is to be one with those individuals who are outcast. We've a long way to go before the church or the country itself is one of tolerance or one of freedom. The prison and the slum is the real judgment on a society. That is where society is seen and that is where society is judged. It's not judged from the palace. The view is always good from the palace. The slums are always hidden from the palace. The sufferings in the dungeons or the cries of the poor or the whimper of the woman is not heard in most archbishops' palaces. Uh, but they are the voices we should listen to 
and they should be our voice. In 1983, Sister Stanislaus Kennedy published a book that surveys women in short-term and long-term hostile care in Dublin. And within that book, she gives us a survey of women held in the three Dublin Magdalens at that time. 95% of them are suffering from either mental handicap or a mental illness. And this is really disturbing when she lets us know that actually only 4% of them had a mental handicap when they entered. I start doing things, helping other people that couldn't defend themselves or do anything for themselves, you know. And that kind of kept me, stopped thinking of it all the time. And I've done that over the last 40 years, to be honest, you know. I've people, I never went for to be elected or anything else, but I've people knocking my door and asking me, can you help me with something? Maybe it's something to do with county council. Maybe it's with a doctor not doing right by them. It can just be anything like that. And I will do, and I will get down and write a letter as good as any solicitor. I only met Frank about three years ago on the internet. And uh, he has a really unusual name. And I tapped it into Facebook and up he came. I worked it out, it was about 47 years ago. He was the brother of, of a friend and we just had an innocent relationship. I didn't know anything about the facts of life. I really didn't. And we just started going out. He just didn't have much, but we were really, really happy together. You can imagine when I found him, I, I remember my heart was beating. I was thinking, oh my God, and it was him. And I said, yeah, but Frank, I thought you were going to come and get me. He said, but he said, I didn't know where you were. It felt really lovely because we met in Brighton. And we went, went along the seafront and we just talked about things and how it could have been, because I know we would have got married. Hello, good afternoon, and you're very welcome to Liveline. Now, you have an amazing story about a, a, a most recent one about a woman called Margaret Bullen. Yes, she died, I think, on the 18th of August. And I believe she was the youngest Madeline in, or uh, the youngest one left. Mm -hmm. She was on dialysis. She had kidney problems. So she was sick, so I couldn't get up to see her. Then the next thing I heard in August, got a phone call that she was dead. She died alone, as far as I know. And she's buried in Glass Nevin on the right hand side in the Mary Plot. Now, she did have twin girls. I don't know whether they're at the funeral or not. Sam was pregnant at the time. And to hear of the death of your mother on live radio while pregnant was not a very nice experience. We were very upset that we didn't know about it. You know, she was already buried and we, we only found out about it then. We phoned the institution to say that we were absolutely distraught to find out that she had died and we hadn't been told that as her children we would like to have had the opportunity to mourn her in some way and that we would like a phone call, an explanation any personal effects, anything. And we received a return call from a PR company telling us that nothing was available. Maggie Bullen was hungry. And she was hungry from five o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock at night until she was finished walking in the laundries after having two babies. She was a lovely girl, a lovely, kind, gentle girl and had a horrible, horrible life, a Did horrible, she... horrible life. People were calling into Joe Duffy saying, would we have her exhumed and put into her, a grave by herself with her own headstone and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, I, th I thought that she was buried there with her friends and other women who were the only people she had in life. Even though I didn't like it at first, I feel satisfied that she is in the right place now. I always remember Margaret with just a pair of grey socks, black shoes, her navy blue dress and her, her blue cardigan. And Maggie would have sold her soul for a cigarette. And that she didn't even get. 
My most vivid memory of Margaret is meeting her the first time in the Gresham. Seeing her the first time. Standing there in her best Sunday dress. That's how I picture her. Standing there waiting for us, so nervous. And so happy as well. She was very happy to meet us. Religious Sisters of Charity said they apologised unreservedly to any woman who experienced hurt while in our care. The Sisters of Our Lady of Charity of Refuge said it's with sorrow and sadness that for many, their time in a refuge is associated with anxiety and distress. The Good Shepherd Sisters said they were saddened that time spent with us has had such a traumatic impact on the lives of these women. And the Sisters of Mercy said they acknowledged and were saddened by the limitations of the care which could be provided in these homes. I would think that a lot of the blame would be left on our shoulders, whereas society in general, who had those girls in there in the first place, has got off lightly. And those, some of those families, I'm sure, and I know, don't live too far away from here, and they haven't come forward and owned and claimed their responsibility. And we've had to carry it. And I, I feel quite a lot of hurt and anger at that. Present-day sisters can only do so much. They've done all they can they cannot constantly be returning to the same questions. In any case, they're not believed and they are discounted. So I and most of those who really could answer have gone to God. I might add one thing. I'm in a teacher training college in South Sudan, which has been set up and run by religious sisters and brothers. It's called Solidarity. Now, I wonder in 50 years time how that's going to be viewed because I'm sure we're making all kinds of mistakes and we're doing our best. I'm certain when the history is written that there'll be lots to find fault with. The women who came to my office and the other women who had been resident and worked in the Magdalen laundries have been done a severe disservice by the state. By the time to get, they came to my office, some of them were quite old. And they had suffered as a consequence of what the state had allowed to happen to them. And the state had finally come to a conclusion that they deserved an apology. I, as Taoiseach, on behalf of this state, the government and our citizens, deeply regret and apologise unreservedly to all those women for the hurt that was done to them, for the, any stigma they suffered as a result of the time they spent in the Magdalene Laundry. Let me hope that this day and this debate, excuse me, heralds a new dawn for all those who feared that the dark midnight might never end. I was delighted. I said, this is brilliant. We have a Taoiseach that's apologising to us. Uh, we were proud. And then everything that we were promised, a lot of us was left short. The opportunity was there for the state to build on that apology by properly compensating them. The Magdalen Laundry Restorative Justice Scheme was designed to compensate them for what had happened to them. The government explicitly called its restorative justice scheme ex gratia, which is a Latin term that means something that's given as a gift and not in recognition of wrongdoings. Depending on how long you were in a Magdalen Laundry for, you may be awarded up to 100,000 euro. Of my slavery, uh, I re they reluctantly gave me 16,500 in 2014. And after four years of fighting, they gave me my other 5,000. So 21,500 for 13 months slavery. And it was slavery. 
I was approached by one lady in particular who asked, would I represent her in applying for monies under the uh, settlement scheme? We went forward and sent in the evidence that we had as to how long she had been in, and we were sent back a response which said, I'm sorry, that does not conform with our records. She could accept the offer that was being made, or she could challenge it in the courts. And my client was not at a position in her life where she had enough time to do that. And so she made the decision, I think rightly, that she would have to settle for what was on offer and move on with her life. The state lives forever. The victims of the Magdalen Laundry will not. Do you not feel that we actually earned it? Do you not feel that we deserve it? Because we do. The amount of people who worked in the laundries, who are going around with asthma, arthritis, corporal tunnel, major health issues because of the conditions in the laundry, because of the conditions in which they lived, let alone just the laundry, you know, the air, the soap, everything that made us who we are today. I'm on 80 tablets a day for diabetes and for the blood and for the asthma. I'm on inhalers and an epilizer. I'm on, I have to use the epilizer. I'm supposed to use it four times a day. Every bit of me pains at night. I'm living on painkillers as well as all the medication. So I have. Nothing can really compensate you for losing so much of your life. What was also inexcusable to me was that survivors were very poorly placed to provide documentary evidence. They were never given any, so they didn't have um, documentary evidence themselves. Some even um, weren't uh, literate, so that was an even bigger challenge for them. But to pose a huge bureaucratic obstacle to a group of vulnerable individuals seemed terribly unfair. The burden of proof should not have fallen to the extent that it did on the women. All the promises they made to us, they haven't come to fruition at all. We didn't get them, but I know I'll keep fighting for mine and I'll keep fighting for my friends. Simple as that, I'm not going to let go. We're sticking together today. <laughs> As you get older in life, you realise the damage that's been done to you as an individual, as an Irish citizen. I was told daily I was a nobody in, when I was growing up in Ireland. I was told I was an imbecile. So all this abuse you're hearing, you have to do something about it. Elizabeth Coppin is extremely determined. Her case before the UN Committee Against Torture argues that the state is still violating the Convention Against Torture because it still says, no torture or ill treatment happened here. These institutions were private and nothing to do with the state. Elizabeth Coppin was not confined in any legal sense and essentially, there's nothing to see here. The state are making out that they had no role to play in my care, in my abuse, or anything that I endured. They're not denying it happened by saying that, but they're trying to pa pass the buck onto the church, onto the nuns. Yes, they all played a part in it, but the state were the ones responsible for me. I don't know why I can't get that clearer. If I won the case, I would just be speechless, stunned, but overjoyed, and I'd hope it would give other Irish women and children, and maybe men as well down the road, who knows, this confidence to stick together, stand up, be counted, to show them that, yes, even the little person can stand up and be counted. 
and would like to be treated equally and with respect. I wheeled my son's little perspex cot into the bathroom with me. Two of the other mothers in the four-bedded ward offered to keep an eye on him, but I couldn't allow it, not even for five minutes. Back in bed on the ward, combing my clean, wet hair and looking at my sleeping newborn was one of the most serene and beautiful moments of my life. I was deeply happy in a way that I could never fully have anticipated. I hate Christmas. Christmas in our house has, has always been very strict. It's sort of get up in the morning, you're allowed to open your stocking. But while they're opening the presents, I take off into the kitchen because that's my time to sit, well, stand at the sink and cry. I cannot deal with the emotion of Christmas. I've tried, but every time I try, I break. My life is gone. And to this day, I don't have a life. I might go to bingo with my daughter and all, or go up to the cemetery. But still, some nights I only sleep two hours. I'm up then. Like, I had no life. Hold on, why did this happen? Why was I sent there? Why was I treated so badly? Why didn't people just put out a kind hand and say, this shouldn't have happened to you? This was wrong. It affected my marriage. It affected my children. I've now got seven grandchildren and I'm happy with my life now, but I felt that there was a great injustice served to us. Sometimes I think we were punished for being born. My grandson the other night, I was talking to him and I said, Connor, you must remember, I wasn't brought up in a proper home. I know you were brought up in an industrial school where they were so cruel and then you were in the Magdalens and it was just as bad, if not worse. And he's 10 and he knows about it. I'm telling him about his own heritage, how his grandmother was treated. Well, I had seven children, five sons and two daughters. I now have 27 grandchildren. I now have 24 great-grandchildren. And what's important for me is that they know about what their mother and their grandmother and great-grandmother went through. And let's hope it never happens again. The truth be told. At half ten, the nurses came back to see how we both were. They gently but firmly suggested that they would bring baby up to the nurse's station so that I could finally rest. I felt a surge of lioness-like protectiveness and cried quietly, explaining that no one was ever going to take my baby away from me. 31 years after my birth mother had been forced to give me away, my infant past had finally caught up with me. The nurse embraced me tightly as I wept in a two-in-one mixture of my mother's loss and my new joy. <laughs> 